Brothers and sisters, welcome back. This is the In My Grow Show. I'm your host, Alex, and I want to thank you once again for taking the time to hang out, man. I truly do appreciate that. A little later, I'm going to play a conversation that I had with Kyra Rudd from Rincon Vitoven Sectory. Um, but first, I want to talk about just a couple of things. Um, one, I hope your garden's looking good. I hope your cannabis garden's looking nice. Mine's looking okay. Well, okay, so I started cracking some seeds Friday, a couple days ago. Put about 10, 11 seeds in a cup of water. Um, they're just now starting to show signs of a taproot, kind of like this. So later on today, I'm going to put them in a um, paper towel with some water and into a Ziploc bag and let them kind of root out for a couple more days. Mm, let's see. What, oh, yeah, I wanted to mention. So you know how I was talking about a few weeks back that I was going to be on Justin Benton's podcast. He's got a show called The Miracle Plant. It's a really awesome show. You should check it out. You know, he tells some really great stories about how uh, CBD has been affecting people in a positive way. Anyways, so he asked me to come on. I was on his show. It came out this past week. It is episode 16 of The Miracle Plant. Uh, go check it out, man. It was pretty cool. It was pretty cool, man. Uh, Got to tell you, it's um, it's a little different. You know, it was a little different to be on the other end of an interview. Um, I don't do a lot of them. I think that's maybe my second or my third one. Um, yeah, you know, it's pretty cool. Um, I'd like to do more of it, maybe. I say maybe because mm, it took me a couple of days to actually listen to the show. <laughs> Uh, but anyways, man, um, I think I went off on a tangent there. Yeah, go check it out. Miracle Plant, episode 16. I'm on it. It was pretty cool. Had fun. I want to thank Justin for uh, letting me come on, man, giving me the opportunity. And good on you, Justin, for having your own show, buddy. That's awesome. All right. Now let's get to today's uh, topic. Like I was saying earlier, just a moment ago, you know, I had I had a really great conversation with Kyra Rudd from Rincon Vitova and Sectory. She is a freaking smart person. She is literally my go-to person when I have a question about a pest or an insect predator. Either one, she is the one I call. And everybody over there at Rincon Vitova is awesome. I mean, Ron and Gabe, everybody, man. They're really smart, really nice people. I can't thank Kyra enough for being really generous with her time and really generous with her knowledge that she shared with us. Um... It, it it was awesome to talk to her, and it was awesome just the, the kind of things she shared, man. So, yeah, you know, it is a nice long episode. It is a nice long conversation we had. So I'm going to go ahead and just get that started for you. Give me a few minutes, and um, then we'll get into that. Cairo, welcome back, man. It's been a while. How are you doing today? Thanks, Alex. Thanks for the nice introduction. I'm doing really well. How have you been? I've been great, man. I've been great. Uh, yeah, again, you know, thanks to, for taking the time. I, I appreciate uh, you doing this. Um, today we're going to talk a little bit about some um, sucker pests uh, that are pretty common for cannabis uh, and also in just everyday gardens as well. You know, we're going to talk a little bit about white flies and uh, hemp russet mites and the western flower thrip. So let's talk about probably the most common one in that is the uh, the white flies. Um, yeah, they're especially here in California. So we, you know, I, I they're they're all all year long, and that's because we have mild winters. But um, yeah, they can do some damage though, man. They really can, and they can build up to levels that really kind of just take down the productivity of your crop as well. And that's kind of the big thing we're trying to to mitigate. Yeah, and it's, you know, what really, um, what's really fascinating is, to me anyways, about the white fly is how they lay their eggs and when, you know, the larvae are just, you know, can't really move, but they'll sit there and suck the life out of your plant, out of your leaf. Yeah, it's a bizarre little bug. If, if anybody else out there is really bored some evening, Google white fly. It's a pretty crazy insect. Only the male looks like an actual insect, what you'd picture with wings and antennae and things like that. And uh, that poor little female, you're right, they lay tiny little eggs on the underside of leaves. And that first nymphal stage is called the crawler. And even with a hand lens, it's barely visible. And then the next couple of stages are completely immobile. They're oval and they're flattened. And they're often called um, the scale, the white fly scale. So that's where the adult white fly emerges from, and that's also the life 
stage that you'd be looking for when you're doing your monitoring of your plants. Um, you'd be looking, well, obviously you'd be looking for the adults and you see those pretty easily. I mean, everybody knows what the adult white flies look like when you brush up against your plant. There's just a little cloud of these little white flies fluttering around. But when you're monitoring, we really want you to think about lifting up those leaves and looking at the underside and looking for these little oval, disc-shaped, kind of coin-shaped scale, white fly scale is what they referred to. Yeah, uh, exactly. They're they're on the bottom. And the telltale sign that you have them is you do get these little white specks also on, on these dead spots on your leaf. Absolutely. And... You know, that's uh, that, and like you said, you brush up against them, the first thing that come flying off of your plant. And that's really how you know how you have them. Um, and they, the thing also about the white fly is because they do break that, the, the, the surface of it, they also vector quite a few diseases. So, um, you really got to be careful with it. I mean, they, they look kind of harmless if, if you don't have really bad numbers or a lot of pest pressure. But if you're not paying attention, they'll uh, they, they'll really do some damage. So, how are the best ways we're going to control the white fly then? Because they're it's not like they're particular; they're just a regular garden pest, man. Yeah, they're everywhere. You're going to get them outdoors. You're going to get them indoors, depending on you know what type of situation you're growing in. They're just they're that common. So, just kind of to summarize, to run down an overview of what we would be doing for white fly in general, quarantining and sanitation. Sanitation is going to be critical for keeping the white fly out because you can brush up against a plant and carry it with you on your clothing to another plant that's clean. You can carry them with you on pruning shears on any of your tools. So sanitation is key. Quarantining when you bring in new plants, new starts, check them. Look at them very thoroughly. Look at the undersides of the leaves. Look for anything that might be there waiting to infest your grow. Um, remove the infested plants, the infested foliage, anything like that that you see the white fly on, the white fly eggs, those scale life stages. Get that out of there. Now, we will touch on that again um, in details of removing them and when not to remove them when we're talking about the parasites that go after the white fly. So we'll come back to that a little bit. Yellow sticky cards for monitoring. So we'll talk about that. You can make your own. Pretty easy to do. Ant control is going to be critical because, again, these white fly are sucking insect pests, and that means they're going to be constantly pooing out that sugary honeydew, which is the perfect food source for the ants. So ant control, you always want to be watching for the ants. They'll, again, they will move the white fly from infested plants over to completely clean plants and keep the whole cycle going. Soap and water to knock down infestations, to knock down heavy populations. Neem oil, as long as you're not in flowering. Neem oil is okay, um, but again, not in flowering. Then there are materials, products out there, spray materials that are biopesticides, um, things with little critters in them with active ingredients like Bavaria bassiana and Metarizium anisopsiae. Then for your indoor grows, the bugs that you're thinking about are going to be Incarcia formosa, a little wasp, only if you're preventively going after white flies. You already see them, Incarcia aren't going to do it. Eritmosteris, another tiny little wasp. Delphastis, a little beetle. And then for outdoor crops, we don't really rely on those wasps because they're more used in protected culture. Outdoors, they're just going to get kind of overrun by how prolific the white fly are. So for the outdoor crops, we're really leaning on things like the generalist, the green lacewing, and then again that Belfastus beetle if you really want to put some out. So also with uh, speaking of ants and uh, let's say lacewing larvae, you also want to control that that ants because they will, you know, kind of fight off those larvae that that are crawling around your plant. Absolutely. That's the other big thing about the ants. You know, so many people are so quick to say, oh, I don't have ants, oh, I don't see any ants. And that's all well and good, but let's be real. Ants are out there. Ants are moving all the time. And not just ants, too. Earwigs, they are fantastic predators of our beneficial insects and their eggs. So keeping control of these little critters that you don't necessarily think of as being pests of your crop necessarily, 
but as having this mutualistic relationship, especially with the ants. The ants work with aphids and white flies and mealybugs, all of these honeydew producing pests. The ants provide protection for the pests. They will move them around. They will fight off our beneficials. And in turn, they harvest that honeydew, just like we tend dairy cattle for dairy products. They harvest that honeydew as a sweet, sugary food source. So they are dead set on protecting those pests in your crop. Yeah, it's a uh, it's 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 a pretty amazing little uh, agreement those those uh, bugs have with each other. You know, um, it really is. Some of my favorite stories are, you know, we talk to farmers or we talk to growers in various situations, and we can really convince them of this relationship. And you'll see some of them really take it heart and take it to heart, and they merely suppress the ants. And a lot of this stuff just comes back in line because they've broken that protection. It's amazing. So, I mean, one of the ways that if if I've got plants in pots, one of the ways I control ants is I'll put I'm either petroleum jelly or tangle foot on the edge of my pots. I mean, what what other things can we do really to control the ants? Because like you said, they're everywhere. That I mean, is how do you, uh... great. They are. They're everywhere. And sometimes you'll even find that they're in your pot. So for a case like that, we would encourage you to take some saran wrap. Um, you want to be careful about painting that sticky stuff directly onto the stem or the trunk of any plant or tree. And sometimes it can cause some damage. So... In those cases, if the, the ants are already in the pot and they're working your way up your plant, we would encourage you to take some saran wrap, some plastic wrap, or even some double-sided sticky tape and kind of wrap that around the stem. Same thing you're doing around the pot. You're just creating this sticky barrier to stop them from continuing their path upward. Now, again, ants are amazing. They will build little bridges. They will sacrifice themselves and build bridges with their bodies to allow other foragers to go on over them and up into the plant. So the sticky barriers are only going to be as effective as they remain sticky. So you're going to have to check it for dust and debris and leaves and dead insects in there that are just building a bridge to get over it. Well, you know, that's, a really, it, that's a really good idea with the, the tape around the. I mean, just make sure it's yeah. not touching oh, yeah. it, but that's, uh huh, that, I like that. Absolutely. That's another real good trick we use for monitoring of other small insects, like the scale crawlers. Yeah, that double sided sticky tape, especially on your twigs and stems, is very, very effective. Now, other things we encourage for the ant suppression, um, boric acid. Very, very simply, boric acid mixed in sugar water is a low risk, low toxic bait that the foragers are going to go and grab out of your bait station, out of your container, and take it back to the colony. Now, here's where everybody, or a lot of people, kind of falter with their ant suppression, is they just think about spreading maybe boric acid in the powder form or diatomaceous earth or any of those granular ant baits that you can find at the big box stores, and they just think about spreading that and controlling the ants that they can see running around on the surface. But you've got to think, ants work as a community. So the foragers that you see running around, that's only maybe 4 to 15% of the colony, depending on what species of ant you're talking about. So the rest of that colony is down below, feeding the queen, cleaning the ant colony, taking care of the young, you know, all these other jobs that they have. So if you're dead set on just killing the foragers that you see, when those gals don't show back up in the colony with dinner, the queen is just going to reassign a new set of foragers and send them back out for food. So you're not breaking the cycle. By getting the foragers to take the boric acid and sugar water back to the colony, once the queen gets it and the queen dies off, the colony just breaks apart. There's no queen holding them all together. So you can really start breaking apart entire colonies. You can reduce colonies by about 75% in three to four weeks if you Follow the recipe, use enough bait stations, and then make sure you're checking them to keep them full with the sugary boric acid water bait as empty bait stations. No control plant. Huh. But well, the recipe, um, if you want the recipe. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, for sure. One cup sugar, two cups water, and two level teaspoons of boric acid. One cup sugar. 
two cups of water, two teaspoons of boric acid. A little bit, you know, a pinch to grow an inch, that's not good. You don't want to put in any more than what's required by the recipe. As ants are very cunning. They can taste when that concentration of boric acid goes over 1%. And so if they can taste that you're trying to poison them, they will drop alarm pheromones all around your bait stations, warning everybody else that there's something wrong with that and not to touch it. So do, do we just leave that liquid mixture out in uh, some little saucer they can get to? Is that how this is working? Very good question. So there are plenty of molded plastic bait stations out there on the market. Um, we sell a couple at Rincon Vitova. We also have notes and ways that you can do it yourself. So a good DIY ant bait station, they're not ant traps, we're not trapping them, we're baiting them. So a good DIY bait station is an old plastic yogurt cup or a cottage cheese container, a sour cream container. Um, now the key is going to be you need to provide some kind of bridge material. So throw in some twigs, some leaves, something like that, some wood chips something where the ants can get down in there and access the bait without drowning. What you don't want to see is dead ants inside or around your bait station. That is a sure sign that it's not working properly and we need to go back to the drawing board. Huh, oh, okay. Well, that makes sense. Because, again, they just get reassigned, now, huh? Exactly. And some people are concerned, too, about having an open cup of, you know, boric acid and poison sugar bait sitting out there with dogs and kids running around. Boric acid is the same stuff that you find in eyewash. Um, our PCA, our pest control advisor, Ron, he says you'd have to drink somewhere in the neighborhood of six gallons of it in solution before you even get a tummy ache. So it's very low risk. But if you still want to make sure and prevent anybody from getting into it, save the lid. You know, use a cottage cheese container, a sour cream that comes with a lid. So you have a lid to snap back down on it. And then you'll just drill eighth of an inch holes kind of around that upper lip so there's an entryway for the ants to get in. Again, bridge material, and then they can get back out, and you can have a lid on it and keep it safe from other critters. Okay. Oh, I like that. That's awesome. Thank you. Wow. There you go. Um, so you were also talking about some, some fungicides for white flies. Is that right? Some what, I'm sorry? Some fungicides or, or for white flies? Some biopesticides, yeah. Now, that's a little bit harder to speak to, especially towards, you know, cannabis and hemp cultivation because there aren't a lot of things that are registered to be used on hemp and cannabis. Oh, sure. So, it, yeah, it's a very, very gray area, so you have to be very, very careful with what you're using and you have to read the label very carefully, especially if you're a grower that, you know, sends your product off to a store or, you know, however that supply chain works. I'm not privy to that, but... You do want to be careful with it. So this may have changed, and I was aware, or I have been aware, that one of the big players in the industry with making these biopesticides, Marone Bio Innovations, they have been going through the process of recertifying, relabeling their products so it does include hemp and cannabis, or hemp or cannabis, on the label. So do look into that because those are products, very valuable products like Grand Evo and Venerate. Um, again, read the labels carefully. Is you, you have to be very, very careful because this is still classified in such a strange way. But the ones that are acceptable, um, the hemp and the cannabis, are the active ingredients Bavaria bassiana, Bavaria bassiana, and also the active ingredient Metarizium anisopliae. So both of those are beneficial bacteria. Yeah that are going after and infecting the insect and killing them. Right, right. So now, are there any kind of, um, let's say, trap plants that are best for white flies? Absolutely. So one of the plants that we really like to see, see used for white flies <laughs> as trap plants are beans. Regular old green beans. Now, we like to send people little packets of, I think it's Blue Lake 274. Does that ring a bell? Just a regular old green bean. You know, I've gotten but, the seed packs from you guys before. Um, yeah, yeah I think they, they were great. A string of numbers. I'm pretty sure it's 274. It's just a regular old green bean. 
But if you're looking for something to perform better, because what we're doing with these trap crops is it's a tender, juicy, yummy plant that these sucking insects like. So if we can offer this to them as a sentinel, and especially, now think about this. So a lot of these insects are really attracted to these plants when they're overfed with nitrogen because they're extra juicy and tender or, you know, when your nutrients are out of balance. So let's employ that strategy on our little sentinel crop, on our little trap crop. Let's pump these little beans with a little bit of extra nitrogen and make them extra juicy and tender and really make them magnets for these white fly and the aphids and the thrips, things like that. So there are a couple of varieties, yeah, varieties of beans. There's one called Strike and another one called Provider. And the Strike was developed, I think, at least out earlier. It's one of the earliest germinating beans on the market. So you can really put it out there if you're doing early, early plantings of crops. And it's got a nice big leaf surface to attract a lot of these pests over. Um, the second one I mentioned, the Provider. A lot of great qualities. I think it's just maybe a couple of days or weeks behind in germination, but it's somewhere in the neighborhood of half the cost of the other one. So, again, different attributes to different plants, but it's just a bean plant that you're using to draw, to be a magnet, to draw the white fly away from your market from. And and typically those bean plants will show any kind of pest pressure before your your actual cash crop, if I understand that correctly. They do. And so here's the tricky part where, you know, it's not just a set it and forget it kind of method. It's not the kind of thing where we're encouraging you to plant a bunch of green beans in and amongst your grow and then walk away from it. You really have to be diligent and turning your focus on monitoring these plants as well. Because as they start to draw over your white fly and your thrips and your aphids, you know, your sucking pets, if it's not a bad infestation that's starting to gather on your bean plant, you can kind of treat those with some of these similar methods, you know, the soaps and the oils, the neem oils, um, the, the different predators, the pests, or excuse me, the parasites. But if it's really, really attracting a lot of the white fly over and it's becoming just this huge magnet for a white fly, bag that sucker up and take it out of your grow. Don't let it become a typhoid bean plant just reinfesting everything with white fly. So kind of be thinking about, yeah, I'm using this as a trap plant, but I'm also going to then bag up these pests that I've trapped and get them out of here. Or vacuuming. You can also vacuum the pests off and decrease the pest load that way. Huh. I never heard about, oh, yeah, sure, but the vacuuming. You know, that is a good point because um, it's really easy for these trap plants. Like you said, if you just walk away and forget about it, it's really easy a fine line at some point where they turned from trap plants to baker banker plants for these pests. And that's why, you know, certain plants I'll keep in just pots, smaller pots so I can switch them out and destroy them. If I think they're getting just way too overloaded and just bringing in too many pests, I can just take it all the way out and put in a new one. Yeah, because like I was saying, it's real. I've 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 had that to where I just forget about it, and all of a sudden it is, um, like you're saying, just radiating past, and you're like, oh, what have I done? But um, so yeah. another good trap crop is eggplants. Eggplants are very attractive to the white fly. Um, now there are a couple of different species of white fly that you could possibly encounter. So there are you know different trap crops. Like, for example, the cucumber helps trap the Bemisia whitefly, the greenhouse or the sweet potato whitefly. But um, in general, sweet potatoes, tobacco, cotton, those are all fantastic magnets for whitefly. So now, are there any um, banker plants that would help bring in some of these um, biological predators if we're growing outdoors, let's say? Absolutely. So a lot of our beneficial insects, in their adult stage especially, they're not predators um, or they need nectar and pollen to be able to make sure they lay viable eggs, things that will be hatching out in the environment. So in addition to your pests as being a wonderful feed source, you need to make sure you've got a diverse just habitat planting all around, you know, outside, inside if you're an indoor grower. Think about some hanging baskets or some little pots of different things here and there. Um, and what you want to think about is 
things that flower throughout the year, things that flower kind of successively. So um, you always have something for somebody to eat if they're flying around. So some really common ones, alyssum, yarrow, marigold, fennel. You'll see in some of our insect attracting seed mixes, you'll see things like um, bachelor's buttons, Johnny Jump Up. But really what you're thinking about, it's not so much which plant, you know, you have to get the perfect plant. I need to make sure I get the perfect plant out there to attract all these beneficial insects. That's not really what we're going for, but we want you to think about the types of plants that you're putting out. So something with a lot of wide open standing room, a lot of tiny little nectaries for these tiny little insects to get after. Um, so think about things in the carrot family, um, plants in the daisy family. So examples, carrot family, angelica, bishop's weed, blue lace, caraway, coriander, dill, fennel, parsley, Queen Anne's Lace, where I come from, that one's popular. Um, in the daisy family, asters, bachelor buttons, chamomile, chrysanthemum, cosmos, coreopsis, goldenrod, pansy, yarrow. Um, then we get into, so those are kind of the, the pretty classifications of the attracting plants, but think about your mustards and your cabbages and your legumes and those different kinds of plant families. And diversity is the key. And native, too. Think about this. The native plants, the more localized things that you can plant and encourage, the more you're going to be drawing in localized predators and parasites to deal with the pests that you're getting. Like um, if we're talking about companion planting, nasturtiums and basil, those will help to repel white flies. So you can use these in kind of a different manner depending on how you're growing and what you're doing. Oh, that's great advice. No, I, I, that's awesome because um, we do have some listeners and I've got some friends who <laughs> and family who live in Hawaii. And every time I start talking about, oh, yeah, I'm going to go pick up some, some biological predators, they're all like, well, we can't get those here. And, um, yeah, I figure any kind of companion planting that, you know, we can suggest is great. Man. Thank you. We're big into conservation biocontrol. And really, I mean – that's really where it gets to the heart of it. There are so many insects out there helping us, trying to devour what we consider pests going after our crops. So if we really just kind of think about how we can augment the environment to draw them in, make it more hospitable for our beneficials, then, yeah, we're headed down the right path. Yeah, that's great. That's that's true. Um, so now let's talk a little bit about the Western flower thrip. Um, yeah, that guy, well, you know, it's, it's it's out here on the West Coast. And it seems like you really got to fight them like on three different levels in your canopy, in the dirt, and just um, just out in the air, you know, just out flying around. Definitely. They're, you know, because I know there's And some, they're very similar. I'm sorry. sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. What are you going to say? No, I was just uh, going to mention just that... Uh, yeah, predatory mites, um, both in the canopy and in the soil, are really gonna gonna help with the western flower thrip, along with the uh, the aureus. Absolutely, yes, and those are all fantastic predators. Um, and again, they are cosmopolitan; they're everywhere. They're widely distributed, especially that aureus. We like to tell people all the time, you know. Don't waste your money buying aureus. You can draw it in with flowers. Plant flowers and bring in the aureus. What was that movie, If You Build It, They Will Come? That's totally the way it is with aureus. Plant the flowers. They will come. Because what you're doing, you're planting flowers. The flowers are harboring a low level of western flower thrift, the food for the aureus, so that draws the aureus in, and then they can move right into your grow. We worked with a mums grower um, down here in Oxnard, and they came to us to control their thrips because they had thrips inside their greenhouses. And so uh, we went over there, checked everything out. All we did, this, this blows my mind. I love telling this story. All we did was we encouraged them to plant beneficial blend, kind of one of the tallest, weediest looking seed mixes we have along the outside of their greenhouses. 
and especially along on the prevailing wind side. So as the ocean winds were coming in, you know, it's planted there as a strip, as a border to kind of stop invading pests, to stop passing by beneficials and say, hey, stop here, or let's get a lunch. So all we did with them was we planted beneficial blend habitat seeds on the outside of their greenhouses. We encouraged the head grower to get large pots and to keep successively planted uh, marigolds, those giant hero marigolds. So every couple of weeks, he would start a couple more seeds of marigolds inside the greenhouse. So he always had a nice crop of these plants to plant as the ones outside were fading. We did one application of a predatory mite, the cucumeris. And after, I think it was three or four weeks, we went back and took a look. He had not only reduced the economic levels of the thrift below the damage levels, also leaf miner that he wasn't even going after. And that was just by addressing the habitat. So I'll say it again. Don't waste your money on the Aureus. Plant flowers. It's amazing. And and it, it looks great. And uh, wow, you, you know, that's... That's kind of amazing because Oxnard does have a lot of agriculture and different crops will be harvested at different times. And as soon as those crops are harvested, all kinds of things come flying out of there um, looking for a safe space. So uh, I'm really glad you said that. That brings up a very, very good point that we don't often talk about or we just kind of gloss over. We, especially out here in California, you have to consider who your neighbors are. If you're growing in any kind of agricultural area, like you just said, Alex, certain times of the year, you know, get familiar with what's growing next to you and when they harvest, when they mow it down. As when those events happen in the surrounding fields, exactly like what you just said, it is going to send a cloud of insects up into the atmosphere and they are going to be looking for some other place to land and feed. So by having border plantings, just habitats all around you, That'll help even stop some of those invaders from coming into your grow. Yeah, and the, you know the western flower thread, they uh they lay their eggs in the leaves, and um they wind up attacking like your terminal growth, your 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 bud growth at the very top a lot of the times. Up, uh, so do we know does the western flower thread like overwinter in leaf material in plants like live plants? They actually, it's not in the plant. Well, okay, let me back up a little bit. So the western flower thrip specifically, it will complete its life cycle down in the soil. So after it does, um, let's see, the nymphs will feed on the plant tissue for, what, eight to ten days, and then they drop to the ground, the western flower thrip, to complete their development in the soil. Now, there's a whole slew of thrip species without a soil stage, like the Cuban laurel thrip, um, the ficus thrip, chili thrip, avocado, citrus, greenhouse thrip, which gets kind of confusing, but it's, it's called the greenhouse thrip. Its family name is Sisenoptera, so it's very different than the one we're talking about. But western flower thrip, yes, they will spend the rest of their time in the soil. So unless you are attacking it in both the soil stage and on the foliage, you're not really going to get ahead of it. So... In the soil, I mean, is it nematodes that we're needing, or, or is there a, a mite that'll get it? Both, yes. So there is a soil predatory mite called Stratiolalap scamidus. It used to be called Hypoaspis miles, so you might be familiar with it called Hypoaspis. Don't worry, we all are too. So you can call us up and say Hypoaspis, and we know exactly what you're talking about. But every now and again, the researchers will, you know, I don't know, realize that taxonomically these bugs belong in a different family. Anyway, it's a soil mite. It's a fantastic predator. We actually use it for a lot of different soil pests, not just the thrift. It will go after a lot of things down there. Um, and they adapt very well to different growth media. Oh. Nice. Um, the thing is they don't survive in freezing or flooding conditions. So, you know, if you're a hydroponic grower and you periodically flood your system to deliver your nutrient solution, the hypoaspis, or excuse me, since there I did it, the stratiolalap, they don't do well with that. Another thing to consider is they are 
the mice, the predatory mice, the striated laylop, they are not as effective as eliminating at eliminating high populations. Um, they're best at once you've gotten them a little bit under control. If you're dealing with a persistent thrip infestation, um, a high volume of thrip, we'll even hear from the flower growers like the mums grower in, in Oxnard that some of the workers, they really know when they've got the thrip because if it gets really, really bad, they actually jump up and bite at their ankles. How crazy is that? So if it's that bad, yeah, if you've got an extensive thrip infestation, you want to do a knockdown with the nematodes first. So they are effective at lowering the high population of the thrips in the soil. And then you could go back in with the strats if you wanted them there for to go after other pests. And the nematode that you're using, the name of that one is Steinernema felkii. S F. Steinernema felkii. Okay, the S F. Yeah, because I know they sell. I know there's three different types of nematodes that are really, you know, that, that there are. And the way that I was taught is nematodes infect soil dwelling pests. I mean, you know, that's what they're designed to do. They're looking for a host to continue their existence. Now, granted, there are different species that are better adapted to certain pests. Um, but, yeah, nematodes like to go after all sorts of things. Hey, so I want to take you back real quick. I just want to mention something about the hypoaspis and the stratiolalap. So um, they kind of changed the names a couple of years ago, right? So yeah. if I'm understanding that right. So if you really want... Which, uh, there was, as far as I understand it, there was a lot of information and research done at the hypoaspis. So, I mean, really, you should look them both up when you're, you know, when you're searching for them because there seems to be either just as much or more information about the hypoaspis as there is for the stradiolalaps. And that's what yeah, I discovered. Yeah, it's a lot of work to go. I, <laughs> that's what I thing. discovered. That's why I bring it up. I was like, wait, they did what? Why? They just make it more confusing. Oh, um, every few years, <laughs> yes. So now I want to talk about the um, hemp russet mite. Yeah. And did um, you want to talk about application rates for oh. um, any of the predators for any of the other pests? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Do you want to do that at the end, or do you want to? Yes, actually, I do want to do that at the end. Yeah, because um, there are some different applications for different um, biologicals, especially for cannabis, depending on whether your plant is in vegetative state or in flower. Especially with the, the size and the girth of the plant, too. Right. Well, yeah, just, I mean, we've run know. into that from the beginning. Wow, yeah. So, yeah, but first yeah. I, I just want to just real quick touch on the hemp russet mite. Um, yeah. Because it's a really interesting, it, it's interesting to me in two ways. And one, that we don't know too much about it. Well, I mean, the only reason we know about it is because now that hemp and cannabis is more popular, we can actually do the research into these pests. Yeah. Because really that's what was holding back the research is just because the hemp russet mite really only affects from how, we're, from how I understand it, we've discovered that it's really only affecting hemp and cannabis it's not really affecting any other um cannabis uh plants like the hops or the huckberry you know um it's really an odd thing and, and i think the closest that we're comparing it to or that we can do the research on is like a tomato russet mite very good yep um, that's what we're seeing too industry-wide that's that's the other sector that gets the russet mite is the tomatoes yep and again, uh, you know, the hemp russet mite is also one of those pests that are going to just suck the life juice out of your plant. And it's got a really, for some plants anyways, for some varietals we're finding it, one of the symptoms is that the leaf ends tend to curl in, curl upward. Um, but it's not for all of them. And again, the, the only thing we're comparing it to that we can, you know, with any kind of real research is the tomato russet mite. Those are very good observations. Yes, that's what we're hearing from growers also um, with that monitoring tip, the slight upward curling along the edges. But again, it's not consistent among all cultivars, so you can't kind of just keep that trick in your back pocket as, oh, if I see that, I know I've got impressive. You need to be paying attention. Another thing I heard from a grower last season 
Um, bear with me, I'm not too good with the, the terminology on the plant, but those teeny tiny little clearish hairs coming off the buds, are those the trichomes? Uh, yeah, right. right yeah, the little yeah okay, brands, yeah. so that is what you really, really want to be paying very close attention to. What a lot of the growers are starting to realize is once they start seeing those go away from that clear color and start to turn brown, that is a very good indication that they've got hemp russet mite and need to start looking closer. So the challenge with hemp russet mite, especially for you guys, you growers, is it's often overlooked. It's so much smaller. Okay, let me back up. So the hemp russet mite is not a spider mite. It's not like your two-spotted spider mite, um, like anything like that. It is an ereophyid mite. So if you can picture in your head what a two-spotted spider mite looks like, you know, it looks like the mite with the four legs coming out in all different angles, it's just that like gross, creepy crawly thing running around. The hemp russet mite, ereophyid mite, a totally different type of mite, they actually look like a little carrot or a little cigar, a little wedge shape. And then they've got two sets of legs, two pairs of legs just coming out of that front, that butt end of the carrot where the greens would come out. So they're quite a bit different to look at. They are incredibly smaller than spider mice. So your 10 power hand lens that most people have, that's not going to be enough. 15 to 20 power, definitely. If you've got 40 power, you'll be able to see them clear as day. Um, they do, another thing about the hemp russet mice, the russet mice, is they tend to start at the base of the plant and work their way up. They are, like you were saying, Alex, they're kind of in the leaves, in the stems, unlike spider mice, which often will leave the plant and overwinter in cracks and crevices in the soil and bark and leaf litter, things like that. The erythiads will actually overwinter and lay their eggs in the plant tissue, so they're even more difficult to get after like that. So you need to be very astute with your monitoring and very, very diligent with your monitoring because once they get established, they're very hard to control. Yeah, there's a lot of horror stories in the industries of uh, just someone's grow just getting infested with hemp and mites and all they could do is just destroy everything. You know, soil, just everything. Take it out and, uh, yeah. Um, so... Yeah, other, <clears throat> other things you'll see, um, a general dullness on the leaves, that that russeting that they talk about, you know, the russet mite. The foliage may also become brittle, sometimes breaks off at the petiole where the leaf attaches to the stem. Yeah, they're terrible. So things to do for the russet mite, um, just cultural practices, staying on top of it is going to be very important. So again, sanitation, clean your growth space, be mindful of your clothing. Make sure you've got enough good critters and beneficial bacteria and things down in your potting mix. So a nice, clean potting mix. If you're bringing in potting mix, maybe thinking about sterilizing it before you inoculate it with some good things and start plants inside of it. Quarantine your clones that come in. I think that should be number one for all of these pests. Quarantine your clones. Uh, remove any old or infected leaves that you see. Uh, remove the weeds as they do cycle on alternate hosts. So weeds and vegetation that could harbor the mites. Increase your humidity. Very similar to spider mites. Low humidity is what encourages their reproduction or one of the things that encourages their reproduction. So keep your humidity levels a little bit higher. Diatomaceous earth can be helpful. The jagged particles will kind of cut into their exoskeleton and exposes them to defecation and disease. Um, insecticidal soap and neem, they're a little bit less effective just because of where these little mites are tucked into and they're kind of hard to get to. Now, one of the big topics that comes up whenever we talk about mites, uh, especially with the russet mite, is sulfur. So you need to be very careful with sulfur, especially with the hemp and the cannabis crop. Um, now, I have read that the liquid products, the sulfur with the potash, the soap combinations like the Safer brand, is better than the sulfur dust. 
Sulfur dust, don't ever use that on your flowering plants. Um, the wettable sulfur, don't ever use that on your flowering plants. Uh, the sulfur dust, it, you, you get better coverage, but it's also horrible if you breathe it in. It can be very, very dangerous for us. So don't do that. Don't apply it when temperatures are over 90 degrees. Don't apply it during heavy dew or heavy fog. Um, sulfur's kind of challenging. There are biocontrols. There are predatory mites out there that are very, very helpful against the russet mite. The two <clears throat> that are most heavily leaned on are the Neophilus californicus. It's kind of generalist. It's very adaptable to a lot of different conditions, high humidity, lower humidity, a wide range of temperatures. Um, not compatible with persimilis. So be very wary if someone is trying to get you to use californicus and persimilis together. The Californicus eats for similar eggs and other eggs. The other one is Occidentalis, the Gallandromus Occidentalis, the Western predatory mite. That one's also really good on the areophyids. <clears throat> you can also pepper in the Cucumeris, Amblesius Cucumeris. That one is marketed as a thrift control. That's the mite that'll go after the thrift in the foliage. But it also helps with the russet mite. Now, I wouldn't use it as a cornerstone of a, of a program to go after the russet mite, but if you wanted to incorporate multiple predators, that would be another one to, to throw into the mix. Then there's another mite that's grown in Europe primarily. It's the Amblesius andersoni. That one also has some really good results against the russet mite. Yeah, you know, I want to take you back real quick um, and just... Uh talk about how important it is to quarantine your new plants if you're bringing them into any kind of grow operation because um, the only way you're getting hemp russet mites is from other hemp plants it's not coming in through your soil it's it's you know it doesn't exist in other plants the only way they're coming in is through the through your clones through your cuttings so you, yeah you should quarantine um Yes, yes, yes. Quarantine, quarantine. Yes, listen to Alex. That is the truth. So, would would nematodes help with the hemp russet mite as well? Is that since they are no, not so much because there's not really uh, so much of a presence of them in the soil. They stick to the tissue. Oh. Why it's really challenging to go after them with spray materials as well, is they're so tucked into, you know, those little cracks and crevices where the branches go into the stems, and yeah, they're just they're hard to get after. You know, let's talk about some application rates of some of these um, predators for all of these um, pests, because, you know, as I mentioned earlier, yes, we have to be careful when we release certain predators at, you know, what stage of life our plant's in, because like we were talking about, um, you know, I'm a big fan of lacewing eggs and lacewing larvae. I'm I'm in there constantly buying them, but I also know that the that the lacewing larvae they're not going to be very helpful in a plant if I have pest pressures if the plant's flowering because those guys look like little alligators, man. They don't want to try to get through a bunch of sticky resin, um, so they're not really going to knock down any kind of um, pest that I may have in my flowering plant. You know, um, for that, I'd look to I don't know, some kind of flying mite, I'd assume. Oh. So, the green lacewing, <laughs> yes, you're right. A lot of the insects, and that's one of the challenges with the hemp and the cannabis, is especially in the flower, you know, that's a sticky plant. If you're a tiny little insect crawling through that resin, that's going to be really hard to just travel through. So... <sighs> Ideally, hopefully, you've gotten your pest problems under control before you reach the flowering stage because so many things are much more critical in flowering. Um, but with the lacewing, for example, you could inundate heavily. That's one we encourage all growers to use because it's so cheap and economical to put a lot of lacewing and kind of overwhelm the system and overwhelm the system with a lot of predators and kind of tip the scale with more predators versus the pests that are running around in there. So, for example, we say a 1,000 lacewing eggs per 2,500 square feet, and that's 
just to get them out there, increase that depending on how big the pest density is. Um, plants that are touching, the lace wing will easily go from plant to plant. Wherever your plants are not touching in the canopy or, you know, as they're young and not touching yet, you need to make sure you get a small application of insects onto each plant because they just won't simply move from plant to plant to provide enough control for you. Now, if we're talking about large acreage, uh, we do say 5,000 to 10,000 lacewing on an acre. And the reapplication frequency is going to be very important. So some of these insects can establish, especially with outdoor operations where there's plenty of diversity to provide them that nectar and pollen that a lot of these things need in their adult stage. A lot of times you'll find that glass houses, greenhouses, grow rooms, protected cultures, so to speak, they protect the pests and make it a little more challenging for the predators and the parasites to do their job. So especially with green lacewing, we need you to think about that point. For some reason, green lacewing inside, they do not reproduce very reliably. We do have a couple of people in whose houses, like got a greenhouse grower, and says, oh yeah, I see them, I see them all the time reproducing. But it's not reliable enough that we can tell people to, yeah, release green lacewing once and you'll be populated for the season. You need to think about green lacewing as kind of a treatment, especially indoors, and be reapplying them every two weeks because that is kind of the length of their larval stage, their predatory stage. So if you want to keep them present and actively preying upon some of your pests, you need to think about when to re-release them so you're overlapping those generations. You know, another thing I wanted to just uh, talk about is um, ladybugs because just they're they're so popular and and I and I understand why they 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 uh. They will eat a variety of pests, but we do have to remember that you know, ladybugs they they like to have a a lot of food, you know, because um, people get upset. Oh, I got ladybugs, but I released them and they just went away. Well, well, yeah, you know they're 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 gonna fly away, and you know if you don't have a lot of pests or a lot of food for them, they're gonna go and search for more food. Um, so and they're not. You know, they're not an instantaneous either um, solution to your pest problem is another thing about predators that we have to understand. Conservation, more plants, more habitat to keep things around. The interesting thing about ladybugs, so ladybugs are a whole, whole different kind of situation. So nobody grows ladybugs. Nobody rears them in an insectary setting. They are field collected. So growers, uh, collectors rather, um, people who have sell, who deal in ladybugs, um, they know where these hibernation spots are. So the ladybugs have hibernation spots in like the foothills of the mountains around here. And they, the collectors will go up and find these, you know, ladybug fogs. You can look it up on YouTube. It's pretty interesting to just watch the ground moving with millions and millions of beetles. So they'll go up to these areas where the ladybugs congregate and overwinter, and they'll scoop them up. They'll put them into big, you know, 55-gallon trash barrels and bring them all back, and then they crawl clean them, which is just like it sounds. Whatever crawls off is viable, so that gets scooped up and bagged up and is sellable. Anything that doesn't crawl off is not a viable beetle anymore. So then the beetles are bagged up into usually cotton muslin bags with like pillowcases with some shaved wood and excelsior inside there so they're not just standing on top of each other. They are bagged up by the gallon, which is about 72,000 beetles. And then they are stuck in walk-in coolers and stored until they are sold off until that supply runs out. Then, so collectors go up twice a year. There are two ladybug flights. So, I mean, that's something to think about. The ladybugs are brought down from the mountains. They are sold and distributed throughout garden centers. People release them into their gardens, and they fly back up to their hibernation spots. The collectors go back up, collect them, bring them back down. Yeah, see the cycle here? <laughs> yeah, that is quite the cycle, man. It's a great business model, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> so that's just kind of the nature of ladybugs. That is 
their MO. That's what they do. They fly back to their hibernation spots. They don't want to be brought down here and stuck at Green Thumb Nursery to be purchased by the cash register. So the problem with ladybugs, ladybugs is actually a huge controversy within our industry because some people really do not believe in the fact that they should be collected, bagged up, and sold. As with anything, you know, there are a few less than conscientious collectors and some of the ladybug habitats are starting to get destroyed. So it's a huge thing. Now, on the flip side of that, ladybugs do have a very important place in biocontrol. The green lacewing, for example, their lower temperature for feeding, reproducing, activity of any sort is kind of 50 to 55 degrees. So once it's lower than 50 to 55, in most cases, you know, they'll just kind of hunker down and find a nice little warm spot within the microclimate in the plant canopy. And then once the day gets warm again, they'll be up and moving around. But ladybugs, they are active and reproducing and feeding down into the 40s. So that is a 10 degree difference. And in a growing cycle, in when you're talking about aphids showing up and not having anything else to rely on, ladybugs do have a major role to play for us. Wow, that's interesting. Huh. So what about what about heat? I mean, how hot does it get before both the ladybugs and the lace wings just kind of slow down and stop really being just predation slows down? Well, Specifically, I don't know. I can't answer that. Um, some of the other ladybugs, quote unquote, like the cryptolamus beetle that goes after the mealybugs, um, they kind of poop out once it gets into the high 90s. They're less active. It's just too much for them. It's probably fairly similar with the ladybugs. We do find that very similar with the lacewing. Once you get into the high 90s, it's, that's just hot for everybody. Yeah, at a certain but point up here. specifically, I really don't know. Yeah, at a certain point up here in Ohio in the summer times, I don't even, you know, you know, we get we get those heat waves, and I'm like, yeah, it's just going to kill all predation out there. Why even put it out? So, hey, Kyra, did you want to talk about anything else? Did you have more uh, application rates or anything else? Yeah, I do. I mean, if you want to... Absolutely. Um, I do. Like cut and paste in the application rates for the white fly and things like that. We can go over yeah, let's do specific that. bugs. And... Yeah. Yeah. What do, what do we okay. use for, for white fly? So for the white fly, your generalist predators are going to be your ladybugs, the hippodamia convergence. They'll go after the eggs and the immature stages, both the adults and the larvae. So they're really great for white fly. Um, if you can find them, like we don't have ladybugs right now. We've been waiting for a rain event as that helps collect them. But you could probably find them locally at different garden stores. Call around. Somebody might have them. The general application rate for ladybugs is one beetle per square foot. Reapply them as you need them. Again, be aware they will likely fly away. That's just what they do. For um, another generalist for whitefly, the green lacewing, Chrysoperla rufolabris, is the common species that's out there. It is going to be in its larval stage for two, two, three weeks, possibly three weeks if it's cooler. Warmer temperatures make them develop through their life stages quicker. So for definitely two weeks, you'll have predation from the green lace wing. Application rates are a thousand eggs per 2,500 square feet or 5,000 to 10,000 per acre. Um, they come in, in the egg stage, the real easy way to apply them is they are glued to hanging cardstock. So a full card of lacewing eggs will break into 30 little tabs to hang around. The cards can come with varying amounts of eggs on them, but the full card has 30 little pieces to spread around the garden. So for the eggs on the cards, we say hang one to two tabs per bush or one to five tabs per tree. Now let me pause right there. When we talk about hemp and cannabis, anytime we're talking about this plant and talking about application rates, We've all kind of learned once, once your plants get to be about three feet tall, we need to consider them as trees in terms of dosing them with insects because they get big and bushy with a lot of leaf surface. So anything past three feet as a cannabis plant, just call it a tree because we need to think like that and making sure we get enough 
predators to prey, enough ratio of predators to prey. If you're using the pre-hatched larvae, so let's take pause. The green lacewing you can purchase as eggs or as pre-hatched larvae. The egg stage is always going to be the cheapest way to apply them. You get the most bang for your buck. Um, 5,000 eggs, for example, is $25 versus um, a thousand larvae is is twenty seven dollars right now, something like that. So it's a big difference in price just because we raise up the eggs for a few days and feed them every day until they get to the, the proper stage that they can be released as larvae. So the eggs are always cheaper. Now the very 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 critical thing for you growers to remember is eggs are low hanging fruit. Think about being an insect for a minute and having to chase down every single one of your meals. If you see a spider mite in front of you and somebody's egg, spider mite egg, green lacewing egg, I don't care whose egg, you are absolutely going to go for that egg because you don't have to chase it. Same goes for the lacewing eggs that you're trying to release. If you release the fresh green lacewing eggs as soon as you get them, that is a free lunch to any ant any earwigs, any other little ground beetles running around, you will go back out there a day or two later and it will just be black cardstock. I've seen it happen a dozen times. I've seen it. Everything. So it's very, very important. If you get those eggs, you need to hold that card inside at room temperature for one to three days, checking it twice a day. Just all you're looking for, you're going to watch those green eggs go from a bright green to kind of a duller gray green and then they're going to go very close to gray as they get close to hatching. Then you'll see a teeny tiny little, like Alex said, a teeny tiny little alligator shaped larva walking around. That's when you know everybody else is soon to hatch because they're all relatively close to the same batch of eggs. So then it's safe to release out in the garden. By doing that, by hanging on to them for a couple of days and checking on them and waiting till you see one or two or three larvae hatched and then putting out out there, you are ensuring a much better hatch rate for everything you just invested in with those green lace wings. The flip side of that, those pre-hatched larvae, they're ready to tap out onto the plants as soon as you get them. So it kind of depends on how much you want to spend. The larvae have to travel overnight service because they are very delicate. The eggs, we can use ground or two-day service, depending on how far away from us you are, because they need the extra time to develop. So there are extra costs to consider, and also just kind of the timing. If you really are chomping at the bit to get on those aphids or white fly and you need something out there, maybe the larvae are the best way to go. If you're a novice to this, you've never experienced insects at all other than the ones you just are determined to kill, Maybe the larvae are the best way to go until you get a little bit more familiar with what you're looking at and then try your hand at the egg. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of the larvae on, uh, on cards. Um, yeah. Uh, but, you know, um, one thing I wanted to mention is that the larvae are going to be the real predator that you want. While the adult green lacewing does go after some live predators, they're not as hungry. And if I'm not mistaken, the green lacewing will also um, look for uh, flowering plants also. And That's what the green lacewing needs. The adult green lacewing needs the flowering plants because they are absolutely not predators. Now, there is a brown lacewing that's native and flies around. Pretty cool if you come across it. The brown lacewing is amazing because it is predatory in both the adult and larval stage. Do you guys carry the brown lacewing? We can get it. We don't grow it. It's hard to come by and it's very expensive. Oh, okay. But we can get it. Yeah, and the one thing I put out to help the green lacewing adults is um, basil, just because it flowers. Just with oh, little itty bitty that's flowers, excellent. You know? uh, but it, basil also attracts a lot of other pests, so you got to kind of put that to one side a little bit. Um, there are also... On the market, there are insects, okay, beneficial insects attracting lures. So little, you know, lures, they're charged with something and some kind of chemical that the insects pick up with their antennae, their chemoreceptors, but they will draw in the beneficial insects. The one product that we make at Rincon by Tova is called insect food, and it's sugar, yeast, some organic toasted soy flour, 
and um, wintergreen oil, methyl salicylate, that's the chemical compound or one of the chemical compounds, there's probably many, but that is one of the well-known chemical compounds that plants give off when they're in distress. So if you're a cannabis plant and you're being feasted on by aphids, you are emitting this chemical compound kind of as an SOS call into the atmosphere and insects with their antennae pick that up and they hear, help me, help me, somebody's eating me, and they swoop in to help. So you can mimic that by, you know, hanging around these different kind of insect attracting lures or spraying around a material like the insect food with that methyl salicylate to draw in more of the beneficial insects. Especially, let's take it back to who are your neighbors, Think about if you've got riparian areas next to you, if you've got naturalized areas that have habitat that's probably already fostering a decent amount of native, natural insect life, you can especially draw from that and bring those right over to your grow with the methyl salicylate. So how are we applying that? Are we spraying it on a car? Are we spraying it on our plant? Are we dipping yes, our and yes, in whatever way you'd want to do it. So we've got some people that will mix it up with a little bit of water and make it like a peanut butter consistency and paint it onto some cardboard or cardstock and hang around little food cards. You can also add a little bit more water to it so it's kind of gloppy and then you could take a paintbrush and kind of just flick glops of it around. Okay. Or for agricultural large areas. So for small areas, that's what we'd suggest. Either do the food cart or just kind of, you know, Jackson Pollock it, just kind of pop the bit around your garden. For larger acreage, for larger agriculture areas, they're going to mix it with more water so they can send it through a sprayer. But you want large droplets widely scattered. It's not like an oil or a soap spray where you're encouraging thorough coverage to smother everything. You're just trying to get Spots of this attracting out into the garden. Oh, okay. Wow, that's cool. Wow. Wow. Back to predators and, and parasites, yes. white flies. So, some specific predators and parasites there's Amblethia swirsky, a predatory mite that goes after white flies, thrips, and some spider mice, as well as pollen and things like that. So, that is a really, really good predatory mite to consider for cannabis and hemp, because look right there, it goes after white fly, thrips, and spider mice. Um, it's adapted to warmer and humid climates, so it needs 70% humidity and a little bit higher temperatures to cycle through its development, but it does not die a pause, so you can use it throughout the season. Application rate, you're thinking about with the leader tubes, so this one comes in kind of a bulk form <laughs> where it'd be a fast release method, so to speak, where you'd be thinking about two to five mites per square foot, depending on, again, depending on the girth of your plant, how much foliage is in there and how big they are and how many pests you see. So one very, very, very generalist kind of um, application rate, kind of monitoring rate is one predator to 10 pests or 14 pest mites. So kind of think in those terms as well. Um, what else was I going to say about the first bee? So they also come in a little sachet, which is slow release, where it's a self-breeding population where it will slowly release its total mite load, say a thousand mites, if it's a sachet of a thousand. It'll completely release that total thousand mites over a six-week period, for instance. So those are great to just kind of keep the predators present so you're not constantly ordering from your insectary and, you know, bringing out a, bo a box every week. So for the slow-release sachets, you want to do one sachet every three to five plants, depending on the size and if they're touching. And then after six weeks, you want to go back through and remove those little sachets because you don't want to give any opportunity for that food mite to get established. It's very unlikely there's a food mite, a food source in that sachet. It's very unlikely because it's a very specialized mite. But we have heard in Gerberas, for example, there was one Gerbera grower that didn't pull out their sachets and that food might did establish. Yeah, so things to think about. In Carthia formosa, that is a teeny tiny parasitic wasp that goes after lots of different white fly species. It is not 
suggested for outdoor applications because it gets overwhelmed. This is the wasp that you need to rely on proactively and preventively. Once you see white fly on your sticky cards, hopefully you're using sticky cards, it's already too late for Encarcia. You need to move past and go on to other methods if you're an indoor grower. So we don't rely on Encarcia a lot as a lot of the growers we talk to are outdoor growers and are dealing with just so much of the white fly blowing in. And a lot of the indoor growers don't catch it in time. So Encarcia is not something we see used in the hemp and the cannabis very much. But if you're on top of it, it could be. The other trick with the Encarcia is it's truly a program. You have to release it every week or every other week to keep on top of the white fly. There's another little parasitic wasp called Eritmoceris. That's another wasp that will parasitize the white fly scale, that little coin-shaped life stage. The Encarcia formosa we just talked about, when it parasitizes the scale, it turns it black. This little Eritmoceris wasp, when it parasitizes, it turns it kind of a golden yellow. So while you're monitoring and you're looking at your white fly, you can also tell if it's that kind of greenish color, you know, that they all look like, that's going to hatch a healthy white fly. If it's dark black or kind of a golden yellow color, those have both been that's evidence of parasitism. So here's another point. When we're talking about, especially in white fly, when we're talking about removing infested leaves and pulling out the foliage that has the white fly on it and getting it out of there, getting it out of the grow, take a minute, take your hand lens, check the tops, the bottoms, look for any signs of parasitism to show that you've got either the Encarcia or the Eritmoceris. You don't want to be throwing out these little guys that are developing inside these scales. So what you're looking for is, again, either the dark color or the black color or the golden yellow color to tell you that those scales are parasitized, those white fly scales are parasitized. And as you're monitoring, you want to look for exit holes, too. If you see a tiny little round exit hole, that is evidence that a parasite came out. If you see kind of a T-shaped slit in that white fly scale, that is evidence that a strong, healthy white fly emerged. So more monitoring tips. Then the ladybug, the little beetle that goes after the white fly, is Delphastus. It's a specialized little predatory beetle that goes after all stages of white fly. And if food is scarce, it will feed on other small arthropods. So it can be used in lower settings as well. The really fun thing about Delphastus, and I have an awesome picture if we were live to show this, but the really awesome thing about Delphastus is it can smell if a white fly scale has been parasitized or not. So if it comes upon a leaf that there's a parasitized white fly scale by Encarcia or Eritmosteris and then just a healthy white fly, it will leave the parasitized one alone and will eat what would be hatching a white fly. I think that's incredible. That, the application rate is one to two beetles per 10 square feet. You want to, you can do lower applications. So say that's too much just to do in one shot. You can do repeat applications weekly until you get that level achieved, that release rate achieved. One beetle per 10 feet, does it matter how big your plants are? One beetle, one to two beetles per 10 square feet. Now, let's see, thrip. So the predators for the thrip and some application rates for those. For the foliage, you're going to be relying on Predatory mites like the Amblyseus cucumeris. Um, that also comes in a fast release form and a slow release form. So very similarly to the Amblyseus swirsky, that other predatory mite, these you can either release in that kind of leader tube at a one-time shot, or you can do those slow release sachets that will keep slowly releasing a little bit of the mites over a period of six to eight weeks. Now, the challenge with the thrip is, or excuse me, the challenge with the cucumeris is they only feed on immature thrips, not the adult. And you need high application rates to begin with because the thrips reproduce nearly twice as fast as the cucumeris. So a lot of times folks get scared off when they hear how much cucumeris you need to put out right away and how often you need to put it out. If you're using the fast release, especially, you want to do weekly applications, one right after another, for three to four weeks. 
again, to make sure you get enough in there to overwhelm the extremely quickly reproducing thrips and so that it kind of overlaps and they go after that one specific life stage that they're going after. So general application rate on the cucumeris is 10 to 100 mites per plant. A liter two will treat about a 1,000 square feet. The slow-release sachets, you want one sachet per plant or one per five plants if they're touching. And then think about replacing those after six to eight weeks or definitely taking out those sachets after six to eight weeks. Now, those are the mites that will go after the thrips in the foliage. The mites that will go after the thrips in the soil, we spoke about those earlier. That's the Stradiolalaps gametis. Its previous name was Hypoastis miles. They come in liter tubes and, and higher. So 25,000 in a liter. The liter of 25,000 mites will treat about 1,000 square feet. Or if you're going into individual pots, you want to think about for these liter products, you want to do maybe a couple of tablespoons to the top of the pot. With the Stradiolalap, they do not like to be mixed in. So if you are transplanting, wait until you're finished and then just sprinkle the mites on top. They will work themselves down as deep as they like to go. They'll go after the thrips in the soil. Remember, just like we talked about earlier, they're not effective at reducing extremely high thrips populations. So if it's a high thrips population, you want to use the Steiner Nema Felsii nematodes. The application rate there, it varies. So check with your supplier because depending on who the supplier is, how they produce it, they might have slightly different application rates. The suppliers we work with, we suggest 1 million nematodes per 50 square feet or 1 billion per acre. Now, these rates will gain you suppression in about three to four weeks of time. You can also have the application rate uh, 1 million per 100 square feet or one, excuse me, 500 million per acre. So less nematodes per the area and you will get the same level of compression in about twice as long. So six to eight weeks instead of three to four weeks. So you can kind of think about that in terms of your timing, what's going on with your cycle, with your crop cycle, and how quickly you need to get on top of it. Then the other little fantastic bug for thrip control is aureus insidiosus, that minute pirate bug. Fantastic little predator, only effective during March through September when the day lengths are longer because it will diapause if your light levels are less than 14 hours. So unless you are uh, providing supplemental lighting to the tune of 14 hours or more, Aureus will diapause, they will go into reproductive hibernation, and they will not be feeding, they will not be active. Now in, yeah, crazy, right? So we talk to a lot of growers that their light cycle is 12 on and 12 off, and that just doesn't cut it for the Aureus. But you can supplement with blue light to prevent diapause and still have minimum effects on the cycle of your crop. The application for Aureus, is one to four aureus, one to four predators per plant, one to two per 40 square feet, or 250 to 500 per acre, if we're talking about a big application. Uh, you want to reapply them two to four times, two weeks apart to establish them in most crops. But again, I'm going to tell you, alyssum, marigold, fennel, those are wonderful coriander, coriander, wonderful attractors of the aureus. If I didn't mention it before, I don't think I did. A lot of those culinary herbs, the cilantro, the dill, um, you call it fennel, culinary herb, but a lot of those culinary plants are wonderful to attract these teeny tiny wasps that go after a lot of these insect pests. So lastly, some release rates for the russet mite and the predators for there. Now this is a little bit more challenging. So we talked about earlier how application rates in hemp and cannabis are, they're, they're still, we're still learning. We're all learning together. This is a new crop for all of us. Um, this hasn't been studied before. So again, bear with us. We're all learning together, but we, we are learning, especially with the spider mites that kind of the application rates that are suggested for regular crops. Think about doubling that in cannabis. So for example, we have this chart that we go off of 
for webbing and red mite, uh, for six inch plants, you want to think about 10 to 50 mites per plant, predators per plant. For 12 inch plants, 25 to 100 predators per plant. 18 to 24 inch plants, then you're thinking 100 to 400 predators per plant. So it, it keeps just kind of stepping up with the size of the plant. So for the broads and the russets, same kind of thing. Once your plants are 36 inches, you want to be thinking in a range of anywhere from 200 to 1,000 mites per plant. So you really want to be on top of the russets early. Rely on your monitoring. Don't just think, oh, it's a watering problem. Oh, it's a nutrient problem. Pay very, very close attention because those couple of weeks will save you so much heartache. So for the predatory mite for the russet mite, again, that's the Amblyceus andersoni. Let me tell you a little secret. So we have a couple of growers that order the andersoni specifically. We get it from a producer. Again, it's grown in Europe, so that's not one of the ones that we grow. But there have been a couple of times when the producer had a shortage or they were shorted from the supplier over in Europe. I don't know. They did not get it. It did not come over to us. They substituted Californicus in place of Andersoni and said the trials that they're doing, the Californicus is a just fine substitute for the Andersoni. The thing about it is, Californicus is like half the price of the Andersoni. You didn't hear that from me, but you did hear it. <laughs> so, Californicus, yeah. Neocelius Californicus is a fantastic predator of these eryophyid mites. By the way, they go after Persea, um, avocado brown mites. So the Persea mite are the ones on the avocados. They go after the avocado brown mite. They go after two-spotted spider mites, Pacific mites, broad and cyclamen mites. Californicus are amazing little predators. Um, the other one, the Occidentalis. Now, the difference is between the mites. So the challenge with the mites and getting the proper mites into your grow is going to come down to your temperature and your humidity. We've got maybe eight or nine different predators that we could put into a system, depending on what you're going after, you know, all these kinds of details. But if you don't know what might you're going after, if you don't know some of these other details, what's very important is what you run your house at, what you run your grow room at. Because, for example, Californicus, it does well 55 to 105 degrees and 40% to 80% relative humidity. Occidentalis, Gallandromus occidentalis, 50 degrees to 120 degrees, 30 de uh, yeah, and 30% to 60% humidity for those. So 10% doesn't seem like much with humidity, but in these cannabis grows, well, especially when you're dealing with things like powdery mildew, if you're running at an extremely low humidity and you're calling up to throw in um, Andersoni, who needs 70% humidity, high humidity, that's never going to work. So just make sure that whatever you're trying to do, you're just very forthcoming with your details of your operation so that we can kind of help tailor the predator to your situation. Yeah, that yeah, that that is true. It's like uh, talking to your doctor. If uh, if you don't give them all the details, you can't blame them if it doesn't work. <laughs> you know. Um, yeah. Oh my gosh, here's a funny story. So before this was an okay crop to grow, there were still plenty of people growing cannabis and hemp. And, um, you know, we'd get calls from people. And one of our first questions is, okay, you've got aphids. They say, yeah, I've got aphids. I need to get rid of it. Okay, what are you growing? It was a big pause. So one of the funny ones I've heard was tomatoes in my closet. Right? Who, who wears tomatoes in their closet? And um, geraniums, that's the popular one. So a lot of the growers would say they're growing geraniums, and that was kind of the, the wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Uh, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm glad we've come a long way because, yeah, you couldn't even go to, like, a hydro store or a grow store and talk about it, you know. It was, uh, it, it's, uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm glad we can openly talk about it because, um it's, just makes it's, it it's definitely come a long way. Yeah, we yeah. would we would say, are you growing cannabis? Because I have a lot of wonderful information to help you. And that would kind of ease people into realizing, okay, it's okay. I can use this word. Everyone's all <laughs> we surprised. can talk really? about this. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, so, so, so much easier this way. Um, well, hey, 
Cairo, you know, thanks a lot, man. That was a lot of great information. I appreciate you taking the time, man. Well, I hope you can distill it into something that kind of makes sense. I hope that wasn't just all over the place for your listeners. You know what? Um, there, there, there are a lot of really smart people. They'll figure it out. They'll listen to it more than once, whatever it takes. Either way, man, it was, uh, it was great. It was a lot of information, man. Right on. Thank you. I'm going to email you. Um, we put together these profiles for the different pests, but there is there's more information than I could even tell you in another whole hour of talking to you. So I'm going to email this over to you so you've got it to refer to. And please, you know, pass along this information to your listeners. And I also want to let everybody know that if they go to the website for Rincon Vitova, rinconvitova.com, you guys have the resource at the far left to where you can look up either a pest or the predator that you're looking for. It is a great thing. I want to encourage everybody to go over there and check it out. Um, even if you just start at the A's with ants, just go through there, man. It's, you know, it's, it's a great way to geek out. I know I go through there every once in a while. Well, thank you for that. Bear with us. We recently switched servers, and some of our pages got lost along the way. So Ron and I are working on reloading those pages and getting things connected. So bear with us. Our website is kind of herky-jerky right now, but do not hesitate to email. We can provide so much information. Man, don't hesitate to call or email with questions. We love to troubleshoot. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to encourage everybody to, to, to come find you guys. Um, I, I, just a great bunch of people over there. Everybody I've ever dealt with, whether it's Ron or Gabe, yourself, just everybody, a lot of really smart people over there. Um, order your beneficial you know, insects from there. And uh, yeah, it's just a great way to, to garden also. Cannabis aside, you know. So uh, thank you for you guys for being out there, man. I appreciate you guys. Well, thank you. We love what we do. This this is truly a passion for us. We're very interested in it. We want to help people succeed. We think, honestly, I think if you guys, you cannabis growers, you hemp growers, if you can show the vegetable growers that this can be done without toxic chemicals because you don't have any available to you, goodness gracious, we can show the world. If you guys can grow this with beneficials and habitat and cultural practices, so can everybody else. So. You guys are going to be paving the way for the future of agriculture. That's what I believe. Well, all right. I like that for sure, man. Uh, well, again, Kyra, thanks for taking the time. Um, do me a favor. Don't hang up. Um, everybody else, I'm going to play a little bit of music, and then I'll be right back. So, yeah, that was Kyra Rudd. Um, I can't thank her enough for taking the time and hang, hanging out and talking to us, man. That was really awesome. Um, I, I want to encourage everybody to go over to ringconvitova.com. Go check them out, man. If, if you have a pest or, or, or a predator question, uh, give them a call, you know. So, um, yeah, a lot of great, smart people over there. You know, can't thank her enough for, for everything she shared with us. And, you know, I, I will be posting up that information that she did send over on the website in my grow.com it'll be in um, chunks and pieces just because it was a lot of information that she sent over i just put up on the website the notes she sent over about fungus gnats so if you go over to in my grow.com in the search window just type in fungus gnats that'll come up well brothers and sisters you know what that's the end of the show man that's all i have to share with you today once again can't thank her enough kyra thank you very much for coming on the show um, brothers and sisters, if you can, leave a rating and a review wherever you listen to podcasts. And go ahead and subscribe to the podcast as well. And um, go ahead and subscribe to the website as well. That is inmygrow.com. And then go over to youtube.com slash inmygrowshow. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Now, as always, you can leave a question or a comment about this episode. Just email that to inmygrow at gmail.com. And don't forget, if you can, leave a financial donation for the show. You can go to patreon.com slash inmygrow, leave a donation there. Or you can go to PayPal and use the email address inmygrow at gmail.com, leave a donation there. All amounts are welcome. And you know what? We just use that to keep the show going, pay for different hosting fees, buy equipment. So, you know, it's all appreciated. 